Metagaming is one of the biggest buzzwords in D&D. And if you're anything like myself, you've probably heard that word thrown around the game table numerous times and most likely even used the term yourself. Well, what if I told you that this forbidden word wasn't such a bad thing and that there are actually good ways that you can metagame that will improve not only your experience, but everyone's experience all around the table. And chances are, whether you realize it or not, you've probably metagamed many times, as has everyone else who's played D&D. So today we're going to talk about just what metagaming is and why it's not always the horrible thing we make it out to be. Hello, my name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and as I said, today we are going to be talking about metagaming. So to get started here, what exactly is metagaming. The definition of metagaming is when a player in any tabletop game, today we're talking about D&D, uses knowledge outside of what their character in the role-playing game knows to define their actions and determine what they might do within that game. So basically it's just using information that your character in D&D does not know to benefit yourself. For example, say you're in a really tough fight against a troll and you feel like you might not be doing so great. So you decide to take out your phone and punch the troll stat block into Google and you take a look at the statistics for the troll monster in the 5th edition monster manual. That is the most egregious form of metagaming. It's literally looking up information about the game to try to give yourself an edge, when especially when it's something your character wouldn't know. This is usually considered a bad thing because it potentially kind of sucks the fun out of D&D and takes away some of the kind of role-playing aspect of the role-playing game. Because your character probably doesn't know that a troll has 84 hit points, an armor class of 15, and maybe they don't know that you need to use fire to destroy it permanently. But if you as a player are aware of that, then that's definitely going to impact the choices you make in the game. Maybe you'll choose to use different spells that do fire damage when your other more powerful spells would be normally what you fall back on. So of course that's going to be considered a negative thing. Thing. But what if you're an experienced player? Maybe you already know that trolls are weak to fire. I mean, if you're watching this video now, you definitely know that, and maybe you haven't fought a troll before. So next week when you go to sit down and play D&D &D with your party, you encounter a troll. You as a person know that trolls are weak to fire. And many of us have played this game for quite some time, and whether you're a brand new player to D&D &D, or you've been playing for years, Eventually, you're going to come across a monster that you've encountered before who might have some kind of trick to it that you'll be privy to because you as a player have literally played in a game where you fought this thing before. And that's where we run into the dilemma of you knowing that, but of course now you're playing a new character who hasn't fought trolls before and they don't know that. It can be really hard to get into character and pretend that you don't know that this enemy has a glaring weakness while you and your party are being thrashed around. But this is where the role-playing aspect of your role-playing game comes into play. Now the way you handle this situation, both as a player or a DM, is going to be different in every group and every situation. For example, if I'm DMing a game for a group of people and I know they're experienced players and say I want to use a troll, I might mix it up and give them some kind of a variant troll that's possibly weak to a different element or has some other kind of weakness. Or maybe to avoid the whole awkwardness of that kind of situation altogether, I would make sure that there's some kind of NPC in place that would tell the players that the trolls are weak to fire so that they don't have to feel like they're metagaming when they use that knowledge that they already have. This could be as simple as the quest giver for the party giving them some kind of words of wisdom as they head out the door off towards the dungeon. Be careful in the troll caves. They hate fire and other such related things. Make sure you have torches with you. Just something simple and completely non-immersion breaking like that. But Dungeon Dad, the algorithmically friendly clickbait YouTube title told me that metagaming wasn't a bad thing, I hear you saying. And to you, dear viewer, I would like to say that this is true. And in fact, we metagame every time we play this game. A great example of this is a spell that's on pretty much every wizard's list, and that spell of course is Fireball. 
For the three people watching this right now that don't know what Fireball is, it is an extremely common spell that allows you to essentially create a massive explosion. You just simply pick a spot within 150 feet in any direction of where you are standing, and a huge wave of fire will encapsulate everything within a 20 foot radius. This spell is notorious for being extremely powerful and chances are you've probably even cast it yourself if you've ever played a spellcaster. Here's the thing though, 150 feet in any direction around you is a crazy big space. And we know that each round of combat is approximately 6 seconds. So you're telling me that in the heat of a pitched battle, within 6 seconds, you're going to be able to run across a field and pick the exact perfect spot within a massive area that will cause a pinpoint explosion to encapsulate the most effective number of enemies, thus maximizing on your fireball spell. That is pretty much impossible, at least for a normal person. And I can speak from experience here, I feel like any time someone at my table has chosen to cast fireball or any other big area of effect spell, it kind of turns into this whole thing where they're looking at the map and saying, okay, if I put it here, it will go one, two, three, four, okay, this many squares, and it turns into this whole thing where players are measuring and trying to get the most effective use out of their spells, which is perfectly fine. I do not consider that to be a bad thing. I mean, that is absolutely metagaming because you're literally looking at kind of the most effective way to precisely use your spells in a way that you would not be able to do as a normal person. Now you could definitely argue that some characters, maybe a level 10 wizard who is a master of magic would be better at placing a fireball exactly where he wanted it than you as a normal person who is playing that wizard would be. But at the end of the day, you are still essentially freezing time and kind of slowing down the game so that you can make it work the way you want it to, which is metagaming. I mean, if you were going to take a non metagamey approach, reasonably you would just pick an area on the map and if it needed to be pinpointed or precise, you would flip a coin under the grid or something and just see kind of where it landed. And honestly, that could be a fun way to do spells like that if you and your players were up for trying it. But all this just to say, it's worth considering that metagaming and kind of looking at D&D as a game is not always a bad thing. But for a more controversial example, maybe something that you've experienced yourself with another person at a table, or maybe you've even been there yourself when you were still learning the game, is the classic excuse, it's what my character would do, which is essentially something that somebody just says when they're about to be a wang rod and do something destructive towards the party. Well, having a character flaw for roleplay purposes or being a roguish kleptomaniac Stuff like that is totally part of the roleplay aspect of D&D. &D. You guys know what I'm talking about. When someone is just doing something for the sake of messing with other players and using the fact that they're in character as an excuse to do it. In this situation, let's say that the DM has invited a new player to sit at the table. Someone who's new to D&D, &D, so they roll up a character and then the DM tries to introduce that character to the rest of the party when they're in the middle of a dungeon. Maybe the party finds an old cell and they come across this character who's been locked up there for a while. Or maybe this character who's being introduced is another dungeon delver that bumps into the party and they decide to join forces. Something simple like that. The hypothetical Wangrod in this situation might see that new player and say, whoa, this is a new person. My character is very skeptical of new people. I attack them on sight. It's totally reasonable for that character to be distrustful of others, especially in a dangerous environment, and maybe attacking someone on site is genuinely what that character would do. I mean, how often have you just seen a random shadow of a hobgoblin or something like that in a dungeon and you assume it's an enemy and you fire an arrow at it? It's not extremely out of character, and in fact, that would probably be quite in character for a lot of PCs. However, as a player, you are very much aware that this is another player at the table that that's their character and the DM is trying to introduce them in a way that's kind of interesting and not just they appear in the party and you just keep playing the game. Giving a mysterious stranger in a place like an underground dungeon the benefit of the doubt and even letting them join the party is absolutely metagaming for some characters. But it's also something you should definitely do in that situation. It helps the game move along, it won't make this new person feel kind of awkward, especially if it's one of their first experiences with D&D, &D, 
And then you're not going to end up in one of those awkward player versus player situations that sometimes end in someone's character getting killed and drama at the table and it's a whole thing. And ultimately at the end of the day all of that can be avoided by just not saying it's what my character would do and willingly bending what your character might do to be accommodating of another person at the table. That is absolutely metagaming, but I feel it's metagaming in a good way. It's metagaming to enhance the experience for both yourself and your friends sitting around the table with you. When it comes to something like metagaming, there has to be a middle ground. So no, I'm not telling you to go up and look up monster stats when you expect a certain creature might be encountered, or to read ahead in a module your DM is running for you so you can get an edge. But what I am saying is when you consider using your knowledge outside of the game, whether it comes to spells or how you're interacting with other players or how you're trying to make your warlock get along with the paladin so you and your friend can play the characters you want and still adventure in the same party together, it comes down to a single question. Is the way you look at the game and use your knowledge outside of it going to enhance the experience for you and your friends? Or is it simply going to deflate the drama and excitement of playing Dungeons & Dragons? Also, it's worth mentioning, don't forget about your DM either. They're fun matters too. They are just as much here for their enjoyment as you or any of the other players are. Believe it or not, we do actually have feelings, I think. Think. In any case, I'm sure there are tons of you out there who have had a horrible experience with metagaming or maybe even have a good example of what positive metagaming looks like. And in either case, leave a comment, tell us all about it, talk about it in Discord. I'm always down for another spicy Discord debate. And if you have any suggestions for topics you'd like to see me cover in the future, whether it's about playing the game or DMing the game, anything like that, please get at me on Twitter, or again, you can message me on Discord. The links to all that stuff is in the description below. And I also just wanna give a special shout out to all of my patrons. Thank you guys so much. I seriously would not be able to do this without you. And if you are interested in becoming one of my lovely patrons, the link for that is in the description below. And if you check that out, there's all kinds of neat Monster of the Week related stuff that you can get there. In any case, thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next video. Until then,